I'm passing 10,000 feet. I wake up enough to realize that something's not right. I don't really know what's going on and make the decision to follow my training. I reach down, grab the two handles on the side of my leg, pull the ejection handles. I'm Jason Miller, a full-time professional flight instructor. On the Finer Points channel, you can join me as I bring you tips and tricks that I've learned from 20 years on the flight line. got up early this morning. We're still sheltered in place here in Palm Springs and uh, it's getting a little weird. <laughs> I don't know if it is for you guys. But anyway, I was looking back through some old footage and a couple years back I was up in Puyallup, Washington, uh, t you know, lecturing for the Air Safety Institute. And um, I met this dude, John Jughead Council, who I didn't know at all. Um, I think I was introduced to him by the, the fat PNW guys. Thanks, Bryce. But anyway, I sat down to talk to him and couldn't believe the story that he told me. So anyway, now as we all sort of sit here, you know, with this thing we got going on and dealing with adversity we might not have dealt with before, I think of guys like John because I think there's a lot of inspiration here just for anybody's life. Um, anyway, I'm happy to publish this. Um, you got to check this story out. This is John Jughead Council. Flying F-15Cs, okay. United States Air Force out of uh, Tyndall Air Force Base in Panama City, Florida. All right. And we were just doing some, some dogfight training out over the Gulf of Mexico there. Six dogfight of the day and won't go into all the details, but when you're, when you're flying in the high G environment there, fatigue, dehydration, heat, humidity, uh, the number of fights, they all start to, to combat against you and stack up against you. And one of the things that you do when you're flying really high G maneuvers is you can't strain at your max performance every single time because you'll simply wear yourself out. And it's usually not the really high Gs that are the most dangerous to a pilot. It's medium Gs over a long duration of time and endurance being an issue. And uh, the short story was I ended up putting myself asleep, unconscious, during a dogfight due to what I finally found out three, four years later when I was at safety investigation school and I read my own safety report was I had about 40 extra knots on the airplane. Wow. And what that equates to is when I went to do a, a square corner uh, to realign what we call fuselages to be able to employ weapons against the jet I was fighting is I strained for about six G's, had about s enough airspeed to get seven and a half G's on the airplane, and as a result of the fatigue of the day of fighting, it actually put myself to sleep. Wow. Um, the good news is I was at 20,000 feet when I went to sleep. The bad news is I had full afterburner cooking in both motors. So 50,000 pounds of thrust accelerating the airplane, which I am no longer flying anymore. So it's basically unloaded to close to zero G, which means it's going to accelerate as fast as, as it can. Uh, and the faster you go in a jet, the faster a jet gets fast. So I will go from about 400 knots to over 640 knots in the next 10,000 feet of about 25 seconds. Wow. I will wake up um, staring at a face full of ocean doing Mach 1.13, 640 knots, which equates to 735 mile an hour at that point. Wow. Don't know how I got here, don't know why I'm here. Of course, over the water, you don't have good depth perception. Uh, back then, the ACES 2, which is the ejection seat we sit on, we had a 10,000 foot minimum out of control ejection altitude. The number one thing that kills fighter pilots when they do eject is being out of the envelope. 95% of the time that is being too low. They delay the ejection trying to save the airplane. Um, I'm passing 10,000 feet. I wake up enough to realize that something's not right. I don't really know what's going on and make the decision to follow my training. I reach down, grab the two handles on the side of my leg, pull the ejection handles. So are you pointed down at this point? Or are you pointing toward the I'm water? I'm in about 120 degrees of right hand bank and a little more than 65 degrees nose low. Wow. So yeah, wow. going down quite rapidly. <laughs> From 10,000 feet when I leave the jet until the jet hits the water is only going to be about another 12 seconds. Wow. Um, I'm actually now going faster than the red line of the seat. The seat has a 600 knot red line or top speed yeah. and it's not because the seat doesn't work at that point while there are some some issues with the survival gear not surviving in that wind blast it's really the human body that starts to fail anytime you're doing more than about 450 knots or 550 mile an hour the human body starts to receive severe flailing injuries 
And as soon as I leave the airplane, I will get exposed to over 1,500 pounds a square foot of air pressure. So what it's going to end up doing is my right hand is hanging on to the ejection handle. The left hand will end up blowing straight backwards from the position out in front. So it's blowing straight behind me. It'll break my shoulder. It'll break my radius and ulna on the seat as it blows backwards and is now dislocated and basically pointing straight out the back. Um, Do you have recollections of that? No. Thankful. Thankful. Mm -hmm. It'll take both my lower legs and compress my calf muscles against the ejection seat um, so severely that it'll take both lower legs and just shove them out the back of my knee sockets. Now because there's not the stability in the leg and because of the speed that I'm going, both my lower legs will end up coming up to my right shoulder area. Uh, that will destroy. So I end up taking out three of the four ligaments in each knee. My left leg luckily will go to the right. Had I gone to the left, it would have broke my pelvis in half and I would have bled out and died immediately. But when my left leg went to the right hand side, it struck the seat with enough force. It broke the lower leg in five spots. That was a compound fracture. The foot turned around so it was more aerodynamic. You know, because speed this is life. just hearing it, dude. And then it leg. proceeded to come up here and flap. Of course, everybody loves a good dog, and you know, I got a two year old black lab at home. He loves to stick his head out the window going 60 mile an hour, and eh. the jowls are flapping. So you can only imagine what my face looks like because a helmet does not stay on your head going 735 mile an hour. 735. So now my face will end up swelling up almost twice the size of, of normal. It kind of looked like my face was painted onto a basketball. My eyes are swollen shut, so I can't see anything. And I'll end up eventually getting a full canopy and floating into the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. So, one of the things that happens a lot of times in these high-speed ejections is the, the life preserver, even though it's all folded up and in a protective case until you go in the water, a lot of times that, that attach point, it's attached at three points onto your parachute harness, a lot of times that attach point isn't strong enough in those high winds and it'll get torn off. Luckily, mine did not. So when I go in the water, my parachute canopy automatically released from me so I wouldn't get drugged down. My life preservers automatically inflated and they worked. And then I will float in the Gulf of Mexico for about two hours before the paramedics, military PJs, uh, will parachute and jump out of helicopters into the water to be with me. Unbelievable. So I'm assuming there's a red line on the chair because you're you're not supposed to be able to survive. Exactly. Past that, right? Yeah. So this was you were lucky in a lot of ways. Yeah, this should have killed me in all ways. Absolutely. Unbelievable. It wasn't my time. It was wow. not my time. So. Do you recall floating in the water? Waiting, waiting? I don't. Uh, the, the first thing I remember is about three days later. And, you know, the PJs, when they went in the water with me, I told them, hey, I can't see and my legs hurts. And they just told me, oh, your eyes are swollen shut and your legs a little banged up. So the bottom line there is if a PJ is talking to you, he's probably lying. But I'll, but I'll, still, I'll still buy him all the whiskey he wants. And uh, What's PJ? Just uh, Pararescue. So that's your Air Force Special Ops troops. Got it. Uh, these guys will, will jump, skydive, swim, fight their way in to rescue anybody that needs it and get them out. Awesome. And obviously their specialty is going in and getting the pilots. Um, and so that was, that was uh, it was nice to have them. It took that's... them about a half hour with me in the water to get me stabilized on backboards and eventually met back me out. Wow, that's an unbelievable story. So, so was that the end of your fighter pilot? No, that was career? actually at the beginning of my career. It uh, it took him about three years to rebuild me. <laughs> Literally, it took a year to fix the broken leg. Yeah. And we finally had to do a, a bone graft. We took bone out of my hip. We ground it up and we glued my lower left leg together. It took another year to repair the uh, six ligaments in both knees. Wow. Uh, we had to bolt the arm back together, staple the shoulder back together, and then about nine months of waiver. So it took him almost three years to rebuild me. But then I went back to fly the F-15 for two more operational tours. I did an instructor tour with the Air Force and an instructor tour with the Navy and served a full 20 years and, and had a, a good successful career. Wow, that's amazing. What's what's your name too for the record, your full name? John Jughead Council. John Jughead so. Council. Wow, that's such an amazing story. Do you feel like, I mean, I don't know what there is to take away from that, but how did it change your flying afterwards? Uh, you know, it really didn't change my flying. Um, it changed my outlook on life. I mean, no kidding, the, the statement of, hey, walk along and smell the roses, that really does mean something to me. Um, you don't get to take anything for granted. You know, my situation might be a little more exciting of a story than others, but no matter 
you give me five minutes, I can find somebody in any environment that is dealing with a big adverse situation, and you can learn from it. For me, when I was in the hospital, there was a, a little boy there, he was about four years old, he had terminal cancer. He was happy every day. He knew he was gonna die, and from the wa interacting with him and watching him, you never would have known it. Uh, the other thing I always teach, and, and I do a lot of public speaking, some motivational speaking about this, is, is go find people to support you. And it may not be the people that you expect who would be there for you, and it may be people that you've never met, and you can't hold it against somebody that they don't show up in the hospital and, and, and help you out or cheer you on because some people just can't stand to be in the hospital. I don't mind being in the hospital if I'm the patient. I don't want to be there if I'm not the patient. Um, but take a small step every day to work towards a goal, no matter what that goal is, whether it's you know pursuing your flight career, whether it's making a, a career in a decision or a family decision. Always make a positive step each day. Find people that will support you. Talk to people about what you need. There's gonna be good days, there's gonna be bad days. And even to this day, I've just had knee surgery number nine. Um, I, I deal with a lot of down days because things hurt. The body doesn't work like it's supposed to anymore. And while it has never been the same since, the last several years have definitely been, especially in the knee category, going downhill. And, and it's, a, it's getting to be a tougher and tougher battle. And uh, I was down at High Sierra Flying, which is a great event yeah. down in uh, the Nevada desert that Kevin Quinn puts on, the Flying Cowboys. And I've spoke at that event twice. And this last year, I kind of talked about dealing with the, the downside, dealing with some of the depression and, and being down and, and being frustrated with things. And, and there's people everywhere that are dealing with these issues. And what's important is you talk about it and share with people that, hey, I could use some help right now. Yeah. All right, aviators, that's all for this episode of The Finer Points. Huge thanks to John for telling us that story and um, giving us that inspiration. Did you guys see that we got the Ground School app out? Unbelievable. There's a 30 minute free trial if you want to go check it out. Also come by learnthefinerpoints.com. I've got a free video I'd love to give you. Also a huge thanks to the sponsors, um, AOPA Pilot Protection Services, ForeFlight, Bose. Everybody has been really great during this time. So definitely go show them some love. And make sure when you renew with AOPA you add Pilot Protection Services. Um, that could come in very, very handy. It's one of those things where if you need it, you're gonna be glad you had it. Also the patrons, that support's been huge. If you haven't seen, I'm live on Instagram Monday through Friday at 0900. And the whole archives of all those live sessions, uh, there's five every week, that's all going up to Patreon, plus all the normal bonus stuff. So if you uh, wanna support the Finer Points, help us get this content out and uh, reap the rewards of all that bonus content, visit patreon.com slash learn TFP. Also a huge thanks to you, the best fans on the internet for watching this video. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, and until next time, be safe and fly your best.